Hey there, I'm Ramis, Chrome Developer Relations Engineer here at Google. In this session, you'll learn how to guide, inform, and delight users by adding subtle and supportive animations to your user interfaces. I'll be covering CSS starting style, how to animate to hide auto, scroll-driven animations, and be sure to stick around until the end because I have some new features for view transitions to share. When building an interface, be it on the web or not, you have to think about a lot of details. Not only do you have to think about what you will show, but also how you will show it. And this goes well beyond basic design aspects such as font sizes and colors. You also need to think about the user needs, the hierarchy and structure of things, the navigation model, accessibility, and so on. And once you have done all that, you are not finished yet. That's because interfaces aren't static. There are a lot of things that can happen in between two state changes, such as going from one page to another, or when manipulating a component, such as pressing a button. And that's where animations and transitions come into play. Research from the Nielsen Norman Group by Paige Laupheimer shows that when UI animations are subtle, unobtrusive, and brief, they can improve the user experience and can communicate feedback and state changes, prevent disorientation, and strengthen signifiers. Before I continue, let's be clear. The animations that you add to your UI should not get in the way of users. If they have flagged that they are not fine with lots of motion, then you should respect that. You can detect this in both CSS and JavaScript by checking the prefers reduced motion preference. Note, though, that this check was omitted from all code snippets I'm about to show you in this talk for the sake of brevity, but assume they are there. Also note that a preference for reduced motion does not equal no motion. Instead of no motion, you can opt to reduce the distance traveled by elements, tweak the duration of an animation, use a crossfade instead of moving elements on the screen, and so on. Let's take a look at this page that shows the avatars of me and my teammates Adam and Yuna. Upon hovering each avatar, a label with the person's name appears, and upon clicking the avatar, a dialogue with more info opens. You can also dismiss the dialogue. As you might have noticed, the changes right now are very abrupt. That is because there are no animations on this page and adding a little bit of animation can make the whole experience more delightful. Now, to add animations on the web, you typically use CSS animations, the Web Animations API, CSS transitions, or maybe even request animation frame. Or you could use a library that typically builds upon those web platform primitives. To animate the dialog I just showed you, we can rely on CSS transitions to animate the dialog in and out. Properties we are looking to animate typically include the opacity, the position, and also the size of the subject. But how do you transition from something that wasn't being rendered before? Well, that's where CSS starting style comes into play. Starting style allows you to define values for CSS properties before the element receives its first style update. That means that when the element is first being rendered, it will transition from those before values. CSS starting style shipped in Chrome 116, which was released in 2023. Since then, Safari has added support for it in Safari 17.5. And at the time of recording this, Firefox has an almost complete implementation, but they don't support transitioning the property display just yet. Back to the dialog. Here's the CSS to add entry and exit animations to it. The opacity will transition from 0 to 1 when the dialog gets shown, thanks to the add starting style rule. And using regular selector matching, the dialog's opacity will change back from 1 to 0 when the dialog closes. To make sure the values actually smoothly transition instead of simply flipping over, we need to mark them as transitionable properties using the CSS transition property. And because the dialog becomes visible in the top layer, we also need to mark display and overlay as transitionable. Now, I won't go into details about the top layer right here and now, but follow the link shown on screen to learn more about transitioning to and from the top layer. Here's the result of the code I came up with. The dialog fades in and out as it gets toggled. As you can see, it works, but honestly, we can do better. For best effect, and this applies to any transition or animation, tweak the duration and the easing that is being used. Research from the Nielsen Norman Group shows that the duration of most animations should be in the range of 100 to 500 milliseconds, depending on complexity and how far the element is traveling. Based on their research, a duration of 100 milliseconds feels instant, and a duration of 400 milliseconds is considered slow. 
The sweet spot is somewhere between 200 to 300 milliseconds for animations that cause substantial screen changes. For smaller interactions, such as a radio button changing, 100 milliseconds is the way to go. The timings I mentioned are used for entry effects. The motion section of material design states that transitions that close, dismiss, or collapse an element use shorter durations, which also aligns with what the Nielsen Norman group recommends. Examples included in the material design motion guidelines indicate that a dialogue should animate in at 300 milliseconds and animate out at 250 milliseconds. With the timings defined, one last step is to set the easing. Seeing something change using a linear easing feels very unnatural. What you should use instead is an easing curve. While bouncing and overshooting using the CSS linear function can be playful, typically you'd use a decelerated easing for entry effects and an accelerated easing for exit effects. You can find more info about this in the motion guidelines of material design. Note though that if you are using something like a bounce easing, then you most likely will need to tweak the duration again. It's a balance you will have to find. So, combining everything I just told you, we get this. While at it, I also added transitions to the buttons as you hover them, and I also made sure that the backdrop animates in along with the dialogue. I think it's pretty sweet. You can follow the link to see the full code. To learn more about using starting style, and more use cases, such as using it for popovers, check out this article written by Yuna Kravitz and Joey Arhar by visiting the link shown on screen. Here's a mock-up of some quick action buttons that are part of an email client on the web. The idea is that whenever you hover one of the buttons or focus them with the keyboard, that the label that goes along each icon becomes visible and also the container enclosing both the icon and the label gets sized to its natural size. When implementing this in HTML and CSS, you'll quickly notice that although this should be possible to do with CSS transitions, it actually doesn't work. The culprit here is the max content value for the width on hover. That is not a fixed size, but one of the intrinsic sizing keywords. Historically speaking, it was never possible to transition from a fixed size to one of the intrinsic sizing keywords auto, min content, max content, and fit content. In Chrome 129, that changed with the introduction of the interpolate size CSS property. When set to allow keywords, you unlock transitioning from a fixed length to an intrinsic sizing keyword and back. For backwards compatibility reasons, the default behavior is numeric only, which does not allow this. You typically declare this property on root, but if your site has parts that are not compatible with it, you can choose to only opt in a specific subtree to allow animations to from intrinsic sizing keywords. And with the opt-in in place, the result is this. The buttons nicely grow into their larger version as you hover or focus them with the keyboard. Another way to enable interpolation to and from intrinsic sizing keywords is to use the calc size function. I won't go into details here and now because calc size is reserved for more advanced usage, such as when needing to do calculations with an intrinsic size. To learn more about interpolate size and calc size, check out this article I published by visiting the link shown on screen. And remember, typically interpolate size allow keywords will get you far enough. A practical example where interpolate size is used is to animate the details element as it opens and closes. In addition to interpolate size, the code also uses the new details content pseudo element, which wraps the contents of the details element. The details content pseudo element was added in Chrome 131 in 2024, and Safari shipped this in Safari 18.4 just recently. You can expect Firefox to also add support for details content later this year, because the details element is part of the interrupt 2025 effort. More info about interrupt can be found by visiting this link. In addition to this new details content pseudo element, you can also use display types other than block on the details element, allowing you to create horizontal accordions like this one right here. And this too is part of the interrupt efforts focus area. To learn about animating the details element, go visit this link. An area where transitions and animations can add the light to a user interface is to animate elements as they enter or leave the scroll port they are contained in. Take this example right here, where each image animates in as it enters the scroll port. Or here's another example that shrinks the fixed header bar on scroll as you start scrolling the page over a fixed distance. 
To build this, you can use scroll-driven animations, which allow you to take an existing CSS or WAPI animation and connect its progress to a scroller. As you scroll up and down, the animation scrubs forwards or backwards in direct response. Scroll-driven animations support Lennon and Chrome with Chrome 115, which I announced at Google I.O. 2023. And this year, we welcome Safari and adding support for scroll-driven animations. At the time of recording, the feature is available in Safari Technology Preview, and I have a hunch that as you are watching this, the feature will be available in a stable version of Safari. Firefox is working on an experimental implementation at this time, and we hope to welcome them in a set of browsers with support soon. Even though support for scroll-driven animations is limited to only two browsers at the time of writing, I believe it is totally worth adding scroll-driven animations to your websites today, as these animations are typically considered to be a progressive enhancement. To learn all about scroll-driven animations, visit scrolldrivenanimations.stat, your one-stop shop for all your scroll-driven animations needs. On that website, I share a bunch of demos each with an explanation to how they were built tucked away behind the info icon at the bottom right. The website also features some tools to help you grasp various concepts such as the view timeline ranges. Additionally, you can also download the Chrome DevTools extension to help you debug this type of animations. And last but not least, the site also includes a free 10-part video course that teaches you all there is to know about scroll-driven animations. So, Check out scrolldrivenanimations.style to learn about scrolldriven animations today. When talking about animations and transitions on the web, of course I have to mention view transitions, a feature pioneered by Google and since then standardized at the CSS Working Group. With view transitions, you can have a smooth transition between two states of your website. These two states can be smaller things, such as two items that swap places, or a full layout change such as seen in this demo. The trigger for the state change can be done through script by calling document.startViewTransition or by navigating from one page to another after opting in both pages using CSS. Yes, you can have view transitions by simply clicking a link. The view transition API takes care of many things for you and you get to customize the animations using CSS animations or web animations. For more info about view transitions, be sure to read our extensive documentation on developer.chrome.com by visiting this link. Framework integration is also available, including React with its built-in view transition component. As I'm recording this, the implementation is still experimental, but that should change throughout the year. Because React's view transition component is integrated into React's core, it can cleverly determine if and when to start a view transition automatically adding view transition name values as it seems fit. For your convenience, there are also some lifecycle events you can hook onto. For more info about React's view transition component, here's a link to follow. Looking at a timeline, a lot has happened since we first announced a prototype of view transitions in 2021. In 2023, we shipped same document view transitions. And in 2024, we shipped cross-document view transitions along with some extra additions such as view transition types and view transition classes, something I covered last year in my Google I.O. video titled Multi-Page Application View Transitions Are Here. In 2024, we also welcomed Safari in shipping both same document and cross-document view transitions. And this year, same document view transitions became part of Interop 2025. So we can expect Firefox to ship it as well this year, which will make the feature baseline newly available later this year. So if you've been holding off on learning about view transitions, now is the time to start. A new feature that shipped in Chrome this year is automatically generated view transition name values. Without auto naming, you need to give each and every element a unique view transition name. Got 100 elements to snapshot? Well, that's 100 names, please. When view transition name is set to match element, you don't need to do all that and Chrome will generate an internal view transition name for every matched element based on the element's identity. Note that because elements in different documents have a different identity, usage of match element is limited to same document view transitions. To apply styles to all those auto name snapshots in one go, use view transition class. Or if you need to target just the one element, give it a manual view transition name like you did before. In the following demo, this approach is used. 
each card that sits in the row gets an automatically generated view transition name. It's only the card that is entering or exiting that gets an explicit name set. And that name is used in the CSS to attach specific animations onto that snapshot. If you already have unique names present in your DOM, for example, through an ID attribute, it is possible to use those names as the view transition name by means of the adder function. With adder, you can read a value from an attribute in a markup and cast it to a custom ident for use with the view transition name property. In this snippet, the view transition name is derived from the ID attribute using adder, but it could be any attribute. The fallback is also set to none, but if you want, you can set it to match element instead. Learn about adder by following this link right here. View transition name match element is available in Chrome 137 and Safari 18.4. The adder function I mentioned is supported in Chrome 133. Looking forward, Chrome is currently working on a few new view transitions related features of which I want to highlight too. The first one is nested view transition groups, which as the name indicates, allow you to nest view transition groups pseudo elements. That way, snapshots of nested elements can be clipped by other snapshots. Without group nesting, such as seen in this recording, content bleeds out of the parent while the view transition runs. But with group nesting, the snapshots of the albums can be nested within the view transition group of the wrapper. And when also applying overflow clip on that outer wrapper, it behaves as expected. To enable group nesting, set the view transition group property on either the parent, which contains all the children, or on each child individually. On the parent, you set the value to contain to have it contain all snapshots of all children. Or alternatively, when applying the property onto each child, you set its value to nearest to find the nearest parent with a view transition name, or you can also set it to a custom ident that matches a parent's name. Whichever method you choose, don't forget to set overflow clip on the parent to clip the nested pseudos. At the time of recording, we have not decided what exactly the pseudo tree would look like, but it could look something like this, in which the groups of each album get placed inside the group of the wrapper. The second upcoming feature I want to highlight is scope transitions. Yes, finally, after three years of hinting at it, our team of engineers are actively working on it. The idea is that instead of calling document.startViewTransition, you get to call startViewTransition on a specific element to start a view transition only on that element. And in that case, the resulting pseudo tree will get injected onto just that element without affecting the rest of the page. It will also allow multiple view transitions on different subtrees to run at the same time, something that is not possible today. Wow, that was a lot, I know. What you need to take away from all this is that adding motion to your user interfaces can improve UX when used appropriately. Building on the core primitives of CSS animations, WAPI animations, CSS transitions, and request animation frame, the web platform now offers more entry points into those primitives with starting style, interpolate size, calc size, scroll-driven animations, and view transitions. And we're not done with these features yet. We keep on refining and extending them to give you more fine-grained control over many of the aspects. So what will you create? The tools are in your hands and the web is your canvas. Imagine the captivating experiences you can craft from the subtle delight of a toggle switch to immersive multi-page journeys such as this one right here. I'm eager to see your visions come to life. Please share your progress and finished projects in the comments below or connect with me on social media. Together, we can build a more dynamic and engaging web.